Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Throwing Bones MMA podcast. I'm your host, Adam Gerber, and this is my co-host, Kyle Wheeler. And today we're joined by a very special guest. His name is Johnny Kid Cavenbo Munoz. He's the Bantamweight champion of King of the Cage. He's 10-0 on an undefeated tear, and he's coming for the UFC next year, hopefully after he finishes that master's degree. Thank you for joining us on the show, Johnny, and uh, I guess thank you for your time as well. How you doing, sir? Doing great, man. How about you yourself? Oh, I'm I'm good. It could be a little bit warmer up here in Canada. Oh man, I bet it's cold up there, dude. I can imagine. Yeah, winter always comes early. Yeah, I bet. So snowy up there. You got you guys get to wrestle with polar bears up there or no? Uh, no, that's that's a little bit farther north. We're in. Uh, we mostly just wrestle with um, overweight women at the gas station. Is kind of where we're from. <laughs> Hey, that's awesome. Those kind of chicks need love too, right? There you go. Big girls need love too. <laughs> Always. All right, we'll, we'll drop right in. I think you've got a, uh, you've got a super unique nickname, uh, Kid Cavenbo. Uh, what does it mean, and how did you get it? Yeah, that's, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, a couple people on Instagram have been asking about it, actually. I never really covered it on really any article, not much. I think I posted it one time on my Facebook. I explained it a little bit. But not in detail. But now that you're asking, I guess uh, I could explain that in detail. So uh, originally I got that name, you know, just as a kid. And Kavimbo, it's, it's my father's adopted last name. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he was, uh, he was born John Munoz. Uh, but then he got adopted and he became John Kavimbo. But when I was born... He gave me the Munoz last name, so it was like, you know, Hispanic heritage, Mexican heritage. Uh, but the Cavimbo name was in my middle name, so that was always there. And uh, on the Cavimbo side of the family at the time, uh, I was like the younger grandkid, uh, even though not, not by blood, but, you know, through, you know, the adopted system and all that, I was, uh, Cavimbo was in my last name. So I just called me like Kid Cavimbo and all that. And, you know, it just kind of stuck, Kid Cavimbo. It just had like a ring to it. It was unique. And uh, that's what the the last name is from Norway. So it's a Norwegian last name. So that's why uh, on my last fight trunk, you know, actually on my fight banner, I had the Norwegian flag on there. And that's where that side of the family's from. So I just, you know, I honor them in that way just because, uh, you know, they did a lot for my dad. You know, they took him in at a very early age. Uh, you know, he didn't have that father figure or anything like that. So they took him in. They they done a lot for him. And yeah, so you know that that's why you know, I I took the you know Kid Kavimbo name, and then I carry it with me now. And then some people ask me, "Are you Norwegian?" I'm like, "No, no, I'm not Norwegian." But you know, I honor the last name. That's where they're from. Uh, and actually, the spelling was different. I don't know the exact spelling it was, but I know when they moved to the uh, to America. Uh, they changed the spelling of the name a little bit. But that's one thing I need to find out, like what exactly was the full spelling of it. But yeah, that's where my nickname com- comes from. So glad you had that. Interesting. And uh, I guess for just for future notes, you know, we see guys like uh, Stephen, you know, Wonder Boy Thompson, you know, keeping the Wonder Boy moniker uh, deep into his 30s. Is there any point where you plan on, you know, upgrading to the Kavimbo man? Is there any age where that happens? <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought about that too, but I was like, you know what, you know, people already know me as that. I'm always going to be that kid, you know what I mean? Like, if you look at the nature boy, Ric Flair, he's still the nature boy, right? Or uh, the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. So I'm like, those guys, they're older, they're still using it. So, you know, I'm going to still keep continue using it as well. And to me, like, uh, my definition of a kid is someone who has, you know, a vision, a deep desire. Uh, and I feel like, you know, I have that deep desire. And that deep desire is never going to burn out until, you know, the day I, I walk away from the sport. But even then, like, I'm still going to have that desire because, you know, I plan to, you know, tr- travel the world and, you know, spread my knowledge of martial arts to many people as possible. Very admirable. More in a training standpoint, um, I was wondering if, uh, I was wondering, uh, we saw some stories on your Instagram and Facebook about you training at the UFC PI. Uh, how much time are you spending there? You know, how's it influenced your development? Do you have a secret contract with the UFC developing you or? Yeah, I have, I don't have a secret contract with them, but, uh, I know a few people there and, 
I'm also, I haven't, nothing's confirmed, but I'm talking to an agency team right now. Uh, I'm already like signed with them. It's, I haven't announced it yet, but uh, they're, they're helping me out a lot with a lot of things. Uh, you know, take me to PI, uh, anything I need as far as gear, uh, things like that that are going to help, help me improve as an athlete. And uh, I'm also going to be in Vegas during the week of uh, the Colby Covington and Usman fight. So I'll be there that fight week uh, just to check it out, check the fights out, and then, you know, get some training in. So, yeah, I'm excited. That's awesome. Yeah, that would be exciting. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering, like, being able to go out to the Performance Institute, just having, like, it's such a it's a great facility. They have so much there. Just what is it like training there for you as a fighter? Yeah, it was awesome, man. You know, before, so before I went there, I've, I've seen a couple people, you know, like, you know, the PI and all this stuff saying, uh, like UFC fighters going there. And I was kind of like, you know, it looks cool, but I'm not one of those people to kind of like, you know, drool over something. Uh, so I was like, oh, why are these guys just bragging about it? It's just a gym. Like I'll train anywhere. It doesn't matter. But when I went there, I was like, oh, shit. Like, man, like, this place is legit. Like, they have everything there. Like, they got, uh, you name it, like, strength conditioning equipment, uh, you know, a sauna, all that stuff, spa, uh, a cage, a boxing ring, bags, you know, grap- a huge grappling area. They got a cafe there, which is free for, like, the UFC fighters. So I was like, man, that is dope. They got everything there. Yeah. So it's like, there's people, like, I when I was there, like, uh, like I seen like Michael Chiesa, like a lot of people there. There's a lot of fights. Like I ran into Uriah Faber, uh, but yeah, I was like, man, I can see why these, everyone brags about it and just lives there. Like they just stay there all day, chill out. So it, it's cool, man. Yeah. So anytime I go, like, I'm always excited to be there. Yeah, it's kind of like that one one stop shop for fighters. It sounds like a resort, honestly. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it is a fighters resort, honestly. And uh, they have like a hotel down the street where they uh, like a lot of fighters stay. Like it's like super close because the Apex Builders right there as well. Uh, so I was there too. I checked out the Contender Series and all that. So, but yeah, that whole place is fucking badass. What's the what's being at the Contender Series like when it happens? Because to me, being in that little intimate setting with like. I guess they have members from the public in, but when it used to just be the fighters and their families, to me that seemed unnecessarily intense. Oh yeah, yeah. So like when I was there, like it's it's small. They're like there's still a good amount of people. Uh, but when I fight, like I'm used to fighting in front of like I don't know thousands of people. Like the where I fight King of the Cage uh, in my hometown, like the arena holds I think up to like eleven thousand. I could be, like maybe more people, but it's a packed arena. Like you walk out and say, "Oh shit, there's a lot of people here." Uh, and so when I went to the contender series, obviously like it's a smaller arena. Uh, it's real small. Uh, but I was like, "Man, you know, it's kind of it's like small." And then the fighters they don't come out with entrance music, none of that. It's like they literally come out, get in the cage, and the ref's like, "You ready? You ready? Let's get it on." So it's like, "Man, you're getting thrown in there." It's like a cock fest right off the bat. Uh, but it was cool. There were some good fights that I saw. Uh, but yeah, a lot of those guys, you know, they fight their hearts out. So, but yeah, it's, it's just a different environment in there. Because yeah, I was going to say, you know, I've, I've never fought, but I, I would have to imagine it's one thing to beat a guy and it's another thing to, you know, actually hear his mom crying right after, like <laughs> echoing through the whole scene. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I don't know if that would, I never really heard the, one of my opponent's mom cry. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, it's part of the it's part of the game we sign up for. So I'm like, hey man, it's all good. You know, give the mo- give mom a hug. But hopefully, hopefully mom don't start piecing me up with a combo or something <laughs> out of anger. <laughs> hopefully, she's more of a mama Woodley. Give you a hug after. Yeah, mama Woodley would be nice, but and, and I'm not like a like a, a Mexican mom. I don't want that chance to be thrown in my face, man. You know. <laughs> And um, just wondering, how do you deal with like the pressure before a fight, fighting in front of thousands of people? Uh, honestly, like I love that pressure. The feeling, it's uh, it's hard to explain that feeling, but I feel like with pressure, I need it. I'm able to perform off that pressure. 
Uh, I've been competing my whole life with jiu-jitsu, so I'm used to competing in front of people. So when I transitioned over to MMA, it wasn't like I wasn't used to it, like a, like performing in front of people. So like for me, like the more people, like it, I do better. Like the less people, it's like okay, uh, like I don't know, I can't like I, I can say I can't like I can't show what I'm good at. Like I'm a natural show off. Like I'm a showman. I want like. You know, I take my job very seriously. So when I'm out there, the more people there, it's like this is my time to show people what I'm good at, what I live for, what my vision is, and this is it right here. Just like an artist wants to demonstrate like his painting to like a bunch of people, that's what I'm doing when I play in the cage. I'm demonstrating uh, my art, my martial art, my skills, that what I work for. So to me, it's awesome, and the more people, the better. Yeah, it's it's the time for you to showcase all the hours you spend training, nobody looking, nobody watching. So that's awesome, man. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was wondering, you're you're currently in the process of getting your or earning your master's degree. Um, what to you is more nerve wracking, going in for that big test at the end of the year, worth fifty percent of your grade, or you know, walking towards the ring? Oh man. Uh... That's a good one, man. Uh, I don't know. It, I'm, I'm about to say the test, bro. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> we were taught. I'm in university. Yeah, Kyle's it. not. <laughs> I called. I thought I said it'd be the test. <laughs> yeah, that test, man, I think could make you or break you. But, I mean, I'm getting better. Like, the, the more I've been in school, like, okay, I remember in undergrad, like, the first, like, two years, I was like, man, like, that, that was hell for me, bro. Like, the first two years, it was like a living hell. Like I like I passed all my classes, but I wasn't the good student I am now. Like I had to learn on the fly. Yeah. Uh, it was like I had a, I had bad experiences. Like so many professors just didn't like I don't know they're miserable, just miserable, hate their jobs. So they, I feel like they take it out on their students. Uh, but yeah, so th- I feel like that you know molded me. Like like uh, you know if you th- you know you throw someone in a street. Uh, you know, they're going to get beat up, whatever. They, they learn to get tough, you know what I mean? They tough it out. So that's for, that's what the first two years of school was for me. And then after that, I just learned, okay, my study habits are better. And then, yeah, so, I mean, now I get nervous and all, but I just learn, like, to accept whatever it is. Whatever it is, like, I can't control it if I get an F, even though I don't get F or nothing like that. But I just learn to go in there, hey, I'm going to get an A. That's, that's what it's going to be. And if there's anything ever than that, then so be it. Uh, but so I feel like that's helped me like <laughs> calm down with my nerves for a test. Mm-hmm. Uh, but so far, like in my program, I'm getting nothing but straight A's. I uh, made the dean's list and all that, so I'm stoked about that. But definitely uh, taking a test more nerve wracking for me. Definitely, I was I was wondering just in your in the general career, I've often you know describing it to people, I've likened you know peaking your your mental knowledge for a test. You know, it's kind of like going through a fight camp to peak your athletic performance for a fight. Um, has the you know ha- has your experience uh, in your education had any effect on your uh, like professional career or vice versa in the way you handle it? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I, I respond the same thing both ways, even though they're both different. Uh, but I feel like, the, the okay, like, so in school, like, I feel like I've learned things in school, but I feel the main thing that I got out of school is being able to, like, comprehend and research things. So, like, uh, like I love philosophy. Like, I, so I feel like I, like I've read a lot of philosophy, like, you know, Marcus Aurelius, Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Seneca, uh, who's the other guy, Socrates. So, like, I feel like a lot of that philosophy I've, I've read over the years, uh, I, I kind of carry that into not only my fighting, but, like, education. So just my overall life, uh, you know, I, I just work hard, but I just try not to, like, get down on things or try not to get angry because uh, it's a waste of energy, a waste of time. And I just try to focus on things I can control. If I can't control the outcome of it, uh, I'm not going to worry about it. But with fighting, like, you know, I train hard. Uh, I can't control the outcome completely, but I do have control, uh, partial control of the outcome. And, you know, my opponent would have the other control of it. But uh, so I feel like, with you know, with fighting, like, uh, I'm undefeated. I don't like to lose. Uh, I just, you know, we're going to keep working hard, training hard. 
And I take my job seriously. That's why I feel like I'm not going to lose if I take it seriously. And if a loss comes, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I feel like, uh, you know, I just focus on what I can control. And what I can control is how hard I train, uh, my discipline towards the sport, and uh, how I'm going to respond in the fight. Yeah, awesome, man. So I'm just wondering, I saw on your Instagram here, you're doing some training, doing some rolling in the dark. Uh, is that something you do regularly or – or what was up with that? In the dark? Yeah. You know, my, yeah, it was on your Instagram in, in the training highlight there. Uh, was it on like uh, on my Instagram, like where I have like highlights? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That, uh, <laughs> not, so I don't actually train in the dark. Uh, I should I should have just lied and said I did. Uh, so maybe other people would start doing it. But uh, so what happened there, uh, the power went out. At the, like the whole town or the city or whatever so the power went out like just a little block right there so we we're all rolling doing jiu-jitsu and then the lights went out the radio went out and it was just dark they were like oh shit what happened like the undertaker coming out or something uh <laughs> but uh so i was like man let's just keep rolling so we just kept rolling in the dark like that's what we do you know you don't stop for nothing when you got when you got to train you know you you showed up to the training session you gotta complete it so we didn't let no light hinder our training so we just completed it got, kept rolling uh and just relied off feel and i'm big off feel so i told everybody else you guys gotta rely off feel so screw your eyes yeah. So, but yeah that's why that's what happened the power went out it was cool though I'm glad you said that at the end because we were feeling really dumb that we assumed that it was like for some purpose of, you know, uh, <laughs> being able to feel your way because there's, you know, there's restaurants where you go eat in the dark and it's meant to, you know, enhance your yeah, other senses yeah, yeah. and make you appreciate the food. We thought maybe there was some application there to jujitsu. Uh, turns out there's just power <laughs> outage. Yeah, power outage. Maybe I'll, I'll just I'll start doing some video training in the dark, start a trend or something. <laughs> I'll say you guys gave me the idea. Yeah, lights <laughs> off challenge. There you go. <laughs> right, yeah, lights off challenge. Um, uh, uh, speaking of training, uh, you're you're trained and managed by your father at Sequence Jiu Jitsu and MMA. Um, there's a bit of a controversy uh, during uh, last weekend's fights uh, concerning friend of the show, actually Thomas Gifford, um, and there seems to be a bit of a newfound concern in the MMA community about uh, like fighters having their father in their corner and possibly, you know, caring too much about your fighter, putting them in danger or putting them in unnecessary positions. You know, how do you feel about this concern in general? Oh, well, what actually happened with that guy? So since uh... a lot of people thought the fight should have been stopped sooner, if not by the referee, than by oh, okay. his corner, which yeah. his father was a part of. Um, the referee was actually taken off of the rest of the fights for that night. The commission found it so... Mm -hmm egregious and uh, afterwards there was some research done into you know the amount of deaths that happen in boxing and it it, it found yeah. that there's a disproportional percentage of the deaths you know have the fighter's father in their corner okay yeah like for me you know me and my dad we have a we have a different relationship i don't uh we're very close like, like uh you know out uh, on the mat life everything but one thing about him, he knows how to separate being a father and coach. So, like, on the mag, he's more of a coach. Uh, when we drive home and stuff, he's a, a father. Like, I could ask him anything. Like, when we talk about anything, it doesn't matter. Like, I know there's uh, some people maybe don't, don't have a close relationship with their father uh, for whatever reason. But, uh, you know, my dad's always, you know, showed me tough love, uh, taught me discipline, you know, teaching me a lot. But I feel like, you know, I don't think we'd have that issue, you know, but he's one of those guys that he, he can get in my ear. Like, if I'm not doing something right during a fight, like, hearing his voice, and he tells me, like, like oh, shit, like, I'll snap out of it. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. he's done it in one of my fights, like, where he kind of, like, uh, he was yelling at me, too, like, man, is your coach yelling at you, your dad yelling at you? I was like, he shouldn't do that. And I'm like, nah, I, I, that, we have a different relationship. Like, uh, that actually helped me. Cause I was kind of, like, starting off a little slow. And then he kind of got in my ears, you know, just fucking got got him, got on me. I was like, oh, shit, I woke up and then I ended up, you know, snapping out of it. Uh, so for me, uh, I don't think it, it, that would be an issue for me. Uh, my dad's like, uh, I think if he saw me in danger, I think, you know, 
he's going to look out for my best interest. Uh, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't want that to happen, obviously. But uh, I want to win. I want everything to be my favorite. But that's not always the case in this game. Uh, but I feel like he knows. He's smart enough to know, and he's he's aware. Like, no, okay, I need to save my fighter, regardless if it's me or any of the other fighters. You know. Yeah, this weekend actually, like a lot of the controversy was around the the corner. Actually, asked Thomas if he could keep like continue to fight, and mm-hmm. obvious, you know, you got the warrior mindset. You're not gonna gonna say yeah. no, right? So that was kind of a bit of the issue there. Um, yeah, and as someone who is also like pretty much most of the sports I did throughout my whole life, my dad was the coach too. You know, could you give a bit of an insight on? you know, the difference in relationship and sort of the difference in maybe how you experience training in the sport, you know, having your father as a coaching figure instead of just having, a, you know, some guy as a coaching figure? Yeah, so, like, for me, I feel like, uh, you know, having my father be my coach, you know, mentor since I've started, uh, you develop a certain respect, I think. You know, you learn who to trust uh, versus, you know, if you just go to a gym, you know, I want to fight. You really don't know who's out for your best interest. You gotta. It takes years to develop that bond. Like there's an, an old saying, like uh, it takes like nine years to really get to know someone. I think Helio, Helio Gracie said that. Like why someone asked him, like why why do you uh, why does it take so long for you to give someone a black belt? And he's like, well, it takes me nine years, nine to ten years to really get to know somebody. So if if it's been that long, you know, I'm gonna give the black belt. But you can't get to know someone like in a year, five years. You think you know them, everything's cool, but all of a sudden you see a different side of them, and you're like, oh shit, like I never, like, what did I get myself into here? Uh, but with my dad, you know, he's never stirred me the wrong way. And, you know, he's like, he's my dad, but it's like my best friend, too. He's someone I could trust. Uh, you know, I could trust him with anything. So I know there's there's some dads out there that maybe live through their sons uh, in sports, other sports, which I've seen it, you know. Uh, I've seen it like in jiu-jitsu tournaments coming up. Like I've seen dads just, you know, they don't even train themselves, but they're living through their kid, putting their kid in all these competitions, and then the kid ends up getting burnt out, like uh, around 16, 17, they don't want to do it no more. And then, like, the, the relationship's all tainted after that. But with me, my dad never pushed me to do anything, like compete, fight. I just had to train mandatory twice a week when I started training, like, at five. And I hated doing it, but he was like, no, you're doing this, but you don't have a choice. You got to do it twice a week because I want you to be confident, be able to defend yourself in case anyone tries to mess with you. And, uh, you know, like around nine, I started loving it. And then, you know, so that's why I thank him for keeping me in. And uh, if he wasn't like that, I don't think I'd be the person I am today. And, you know, I'm, I'm very confident in uh, any situation that uh, I do. Uh, so I'm, I'm truly thankful for him for keeping me in, it, in the sport and introducing me. And I'm glad he's my coach. Well, yeah, and it, you have that head start over every other fighter where, you know, they need that nine or ten years, whereas he's known you since since birth. He knows not only your personality, but he knows your threshold. He knows how much you can take. He knows how much you can give. And, uh, and yeah. not to mention with that comment about, you know, fathers living vicariously through their sons, I feel like you've just described about one-third of the Canadian population's relationship with hockey. Oh, okay. I've heard actually a little bit about that. Uh I think I, I started, I think Outliers, there's a book, Outliers, I don't know if you guys heard of it, mm-hmm. about like, it talked about hockey in Canada, well, it talked about a lot of things, but it mentioned hockey, and about like, dad, like, pushing their kids, but, like, the kids would get, or like, born in the beginning of the year, get picked, or something like that, but uh, I actually read a little bit about the hockey thing, the dads are all crazy about it. Yeah, I quit being a hockey referee, because I kept getting in fights with the parents in the parking lot. Oh man, yeah, the parents are, that's another thing, man, like, uh, like I'm a referee for jiu-jitsu tournaments as well, so there's so many parents, like, that complain, like, you know, like, I'm, well, you know, it, it's in any sport, you know what I mean? Uh, the parents are the worst, like, they just complain their kid loses, oh, the, you screwed my kid over, it's like, you can't win, like, uh, for kids' competitions, you gotta stop the matchup, like, they say, uh, the kid got put in an arm bar and the arms fully extended. You have to stop the match. But you hear like the parents, my kid could have kept going. He didn't tap. And I'm like, okay, well, if I would have let your kid keep going, if your kid's arm breaks, then you would have been like, do your job, ref. So it's like you don't win. Yeah. Like you're screwed either way. Yeah, there's no in between. So, yeah, parents are just, uh, I don't know, like 
I think parents need to stop living through their kid and get involved more. Maybe, you know, play the sport with their kid. Uh, that's another thing I see, too. Kids don't respect their parents because their parents, they see their parents just on the other side of it. They don't see their parents doing the same activity. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why, as well, like I respect my dad so much because I've seen him train. I've seen him compete, you know, back in the day and all that. Uh, versus, like, if I didn't see him do all that, I don't know if I'd look at him the same way. That maybe I'd be thinking like, well, he's saying, you know, teach me all this, uh, but he's not practicing what he preaches, you know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you you see, like you see from the work he's put in, you know, what he's doing works, and you know, it gives you that trust to to listen to him and learn from him. Yeah, exactly. I'm a big believer. Like, uh, I'll follow anybody, but I need to be able to see that person do it. Like, are you really living by that? that word are you do you live by the sword or are you just talking out of your ass yeah it's like show me show me what you know yeah don't tell me exactly and uh yeah. hey johnny uh just another question here for you you know your dad's obviously your mentor coach does a lot for you do you have any training partners you'd maybe want to give a shout out to you know help you get that good work in during training camps oh yeah definitely man uh you know, my number one training partner is uh, my little brother. He's actually he's my cousin, but, you know, we're brothers. Uh, we were always with each other. So, like, we're basically brothers now. It's Alan uh, Superglue Martinez. He's 2-0 uh, as an amateur. Uh, and he has a bright future ahead of, uh, ahead of him. Uh, that's, like, my number one training partner. So, it's like, you know, I see him fighting these guys. I'm like, these guys are fucked. Because, like, I know how good he is. Uh, but yeah, that's like that dude right there. He's fighting in December. Uh, you know, my other another guy has helped me a lot coming up. Uh, Ruben Duran. Uh, he fought in the UFC. Former King of the Cage champion. Uh, you know, when I started in the MMA journey, he was a key training partner. Uh, you know, just taught me a lot about the whole game, how it is, and uh, you know, just got me ready for, got me tougher in the sport and everything. Uh, yeah, but like those two guys right there. And then uh, I have a lot of I have a lot of other teammates. You know, there's, there's honestly too many. Uh, I have a uh, like a group of team. I call them Los Hijos del Otro Lado, which is Spanish for uh, you know the the sons from the other side. Uh, it's, you know, it consists of me, you know, Alan, which is like you know my brother, and then uh, Eric Villapando and Leo Vega. Uh, we just started that group one time because uh, uh, we're all Mexican. We speak Spanish, and but they were there for me when I needed them a lot of times because. You know, when you come up in this game, there's so many uh, people that you that you'll see, and you you realize who has your back, who's there for you uh, during training camps. Like when you need someone, hey, I need training today, but that person can't show up. Uh, and I understand everybody has life, but when people go the extra mile for you, it gives you a different you know opinion about them. So that's why, like you know, those guys I've all mentioned, like they've been there for me, and I'll be there for them anytime they need me. Like I'm quick to return the favor like i don't expect you just to do for me if you do for me I'll, i'm gonna do for you so like i like, i appreciate that guys support that's awesome um and it's, it's great to have that sort of support system coming up and hopefully we see that sort of resurgence and that uh sequence jujitsu breakout the same way we've seen you know the city kickboxing breakout and the sgbi uh, sgb ireland breakout and such hopefully the whole team yeah that. um I'm going to ask uh, specifically sort of uh, making it to the UFC sort of situations. Uh, and sort of around June, July, you were f- scheduled to face Draco Rodriguez. And he was also in simultaneous negotiations to be pulled into the UFC to replace Sean O'Malley against Marlon Vera at UFC 239. That didn't go through. There was this big commotion about the King of the Cage not releasing him from his contract. A few months later, um, they ended up holding back Anthony Romero from going to the Contender Series based on his contract, you know. Um, and it seems common for promotion to promotions to let these guys go when they get the call-up. Um, what do you think of the contracts holding these guys up? Um, is it something that maybe worries you in the future if you get the call up or is it something that doesn't really concern you at the moment? Uh, well, for me, I think it's going to be good for me. I don't know what, I can't talk to those other guys. Uh, I don't know what their business relationship or what kind of contract, what kind of deal they had. Uh, so I can't really speak on their behalf. I don't like, you know, they could be great guys. I don't know, but I know business can be a little, sketchy sometimes uh but for me 
you know, I've done a lot for the company. You know, they've done a lot for me also, you know, you know, allow me to have fights, a place to fight, uh, develop my name, you know, win a belt. And uh, so without them, like, obviously, uh, we wouldn't be talking right now on this interview because, you know, they gave me a, a, a platform to grow my name. So I'm thankful for that. But, uh, you know, I've also done a lot for the company, too. You know, as far as uh, every time I fight, I bring a big crowd, uh, which is money. Uh, anytime I'm on a car, it equals money for, you know, for everybody involved. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, just I have, I have a big crowd I bring to them. So I'm always delivering and I fought for them. Uh, let me see, I'm 10 and 0 pro, 3 and 0 amateur. All my fights have been with King of the Cage. So that's 13 fights right there. 13 fights I brought a lot of people, the same members of crowd. Like, it's not just one fight. Like, there's some guys, they'll fight. Oh, I bring a big crowd. They'll do it one fight. But then after that, their fan base, I don't know, like, people flake out and they can't bring the same member. But my members are always consistent or either just growing. So, but I feel like, I, you know, I have a good relationship with them. And I don't think it's going to be an issue of, uh, of me getting released. Uh, but yeah, and I, I, you know, I just, you know, I'm very upfront. So, like, you know, if I commit to a fight, I'm going to do that fight. And, uh, you know, if the UFC calls, uh, it's one of those things. That's, I know it's a tough decision, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to co- commit to the fight that I said I was going to do. Uh, if they let me out, cool. But, uh, I can say like, hey, you know, I need to fight this fight. It, it all depends like how far out and uh, you are from the fight. If, if say if, like UFC calls and you're like two days away from the fight, I think any promoter or business owner would be pissed off. But if it was like maybe a a month or two away, like there's plenty of notes like to get another guy. Uh, so I feel like that was the thing with the Draco thing. Like we were supposed to fight, he pulled out like so super soon to our fight, and uh, so it, it kind of raised a lot of questions like. I don't know, like, maybe had he been more upfront about it, uh, things could have been different for him. But, yeah, I don't know. But I feel like in this business, like, uh, there's a lot of cutthroat people out there, but at the same time, like, you got to be upfront. Like, that's the best thing you could do is just be upfront and uh, be that be that snake on the road, not the snake on the grass. Because people see the snake on the road, they can move out of the way. It's their choice. But if they see a, a snake in the grass, they don't see it. They get bit out of nowhere. Like, for me, I'm the snake on the road. Like, you see me coming. It's your choice to move or not. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's uh, you know, a matter of not only fulfilling your contract, but, you know, like you said, you've had your whole career with them. And, and also, you know, like Chael Sonnen likes to say all the time, you know, not a lot of people sign the front of checks. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, so, I mean, like, for me, like – you know, getting in to all this, I want to be in the UFC. Like, that's, like, a lot of people ask me, where do you want to go, Bellator 1? Uh, I'm like, I want to go to the UFC. Like, that's where I want to be. I feel like uh, the platform, as far as notoriety, is larger. Uh, I've been hearing a lot of good things about 1. But for me, like, UFC has a big legacy. There's a lot of history to it. That's where I want to be. And, uh, yeah, so I've been, I'm, I'm trying to come out of King of the Cage, you know. King of the Cage let, let it me out. Would it, it would benefit them too. You know, I'm a King of the Cage fighter. Uh, makes them look good. I'm performing well in the UFC, and I'm always going to be around the King of the Cage venues. You know, my teammates fight there, whatever. So I feel it'd be good for both parties. But I feel like I'm not going to have that issue uh, leaving. And Johnny, how was it when you finally won the King of the Cage belt? How was that feeling? Yeah, it was. That was a that was a good feeling, man. Uh, like I said, like so, I've I've been a king of cage, king of the cage event since like I don't know, like little kid, bro. Uh, you know, I've had like old teammates fight back in the day, king of the cage. So I've always been around it my whole life. It was one of those things, like you know, I won the belt. But that's crazy. Like I was around it as a kid, going to those fights, and I won that promotion as well. It was, it was a good feeling. Uh, but when I won the belt, like I was excited and everything, uh, as what I mentioned. But I feel like I was already the champion month prior, uh, even though I didn't have it around my waist. Because there was a couple of times I was supposed to fight for the belt, but there was a lot of uh, you know guys that had pulled out, or the fight got canceled, or you know that kind of stuff. And so like I felt like I, like even as the people, I was always a champ. The people knew who the champ was. So when I won it, it was kind of like well, I already knew I was a champ. But even though it was exciting and everything, 
it was something I already knew I was, and I think a lot of people already knew. Yeah, you're expecting it, right? And but what a cool thing to you know yeah. experience to share with your dad, having your dad as a coach to be there for that experience. So, oh yeah, how awesome. Yeah, that was a great experience, definitely for sure, hands down. And um. Uh, just you know, moving on. Uh, do you keep up with the UFC and the happenings uh, generally? Or are you still a fan? You know, a lot of fighters say they have difficulty maintaining their fandom when they dedicate so much time to training. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, uh, I keep up with it, but I'm always training. So like, don't, I'm really uh, on social media probably at night a little bit more, or when I'm not training. Uh, but yeah, like I follow like UFC, like on um, I'll see what they post on Instagram, Twitter occasionally. Uh, but as far as like you know things like uh, like the little side stories that maybe happened before or after a fight, those kind of things I usually don't know about till like maybe a day or two later. So I don't mm-hmm. know if that's uh, late. Most people maybe are on it more, but uh, for me, I just you know I'm focused on my career, my training path. So I'll get a lot of that stuff later. Yeah, and um, so obviously Henry Cejudo is the bantamweight champ for the UFC right now. What do you think of you know he's been call- he was calling out Valentina Shevchenko for an intergender fight. <laughs> what do you think of some of the stuff uh, Henry's pulling off there? Oh man, the the intergender stuff that was, I that was a little weird. Uh, but it's kind of funny. Uh, I was like, man, is he gonna like? get a sex change or something or that's why I took it out when I first seen it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, Henry, I think a lot of the stuff he does, but honestly, it's a little cheesy, but I, I think it works for him. It works for his personality and, uh, it, it's people are talking. So anytime you get people talking, I think it's good. Uh, you know, whether it's bad or if it's good stuff, because regardless, if you're a good guy, people are always going to talk. They're either going to like you. Or they're going to hate you. If you're a bad guy, you know, maybe a lot of people are going to like you, but people are still talking at the end of the day. So I think you just got to, you know, find what fits you and then most importantly be yourself. But, uh, yeah, uh, a lot of stuff he said, like, some of it's funny, but the intergender stuff, I was like, man, I was way out there. I started calling out chicks and stuff. Yeah, that's but, yeah, that, I, mean, <laughs> I think he called out, or a lot of the chicks, I think it, okay, so the positive thing about it, now that I, you mentioned it, uh, when he, I forget who was the first chick he called out. Was it Chevchenko? Yeah, Valentino Shevchenko. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but if you notice, like, there's like, uh, what's the girl's name? The Wally Zhang, the 115 yeah, pound yeah. champ. Yeah, yeah. So like, she, I think, called him out. So it's like, I think it's given like, like she jumped on that train, and which is smart. Like, if I was a girl fighter, I'd jump on that train too. Why? Well, because you're getting uh, exposure. You know, it's gonna get a story out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, people uh, are gonna so retweet like it's hel- it's, Yeah, but it's helping the chick fighters. You know what I mean? It's, it's giving them a story. Like where em- women's MMA is starting to grow more. Uh, but I feel like by Henry doing that, it's actually helping women fighters. You know, if they want to jump on the train and start calling them out. <laughs> I'm just looking at a business standpoint. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, when but- he said he was gonna save the flyweight division, he didn't really specify which flyweight division, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess he's going to save the women's flyweight division, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, Johnny, since we're talking about the UFC, how do you match up with the UFC's bantamweight division? I feel I do very well in there, man. Uh, you know, I bring a different fighting style. Uh, a lot of people just think I'm a jiu-jitsu guy. Uh, but that's cool if they think that but when they get hit in the face, uh, when I give him the whole taco shot to the face, you know, they're going to realize, oh, he's not just a jiu-jitsu guy. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I feel like I, I fare up very well, and there's a lot of great fighters in there, uh, you know, that take it seriously. But I'm, I feel I do well in there. I feel I give a lot of those guys great fights, and they're all exciting fights. So, yeah, I feel like I can't wait to be there and start fighting some of those guys, man. Uh, it's going to be so cool. And I get to showcase what I'm able to do. And, uh make a name for myself in there. I'm going to make Henry Cejudo bend that knee if he's still around. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, you, you mentioned your jiu-jitsu game being the jiu-jitsu guy. Um, to you, who ha- right now, who has the most impressive jiu-jitsu game in MMA? In MMA? Let me see. Uh, Dylan Dennis. No, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, <laughs> come see. I, <laughs> Scared me there. Uh, I don't... Yeah. 
I'm trying to think of who. I, I, I'm going to say me, but uh, David Meyer is real good. I would say, I know he's kind of like, you know, maybe on his way out of his career. No, I don't want to give, you know, just say that, but I know uh, he's had a couple setbacks. But I feel like Damian Meyer, like, it's just he's real good. Like, the way he transitions into things. Uh, I'm trying to think of another fighter. Khabib is Sambo, but, like, his grappling is, is very good. The, the stuff he does down there. Uh, but I guess that's Sambo. But for jiu-jitsu, uh, you know, Kron Gracie, he's very good. But I just think he needs to l- learn other areas of the fighting game. And I think it's jiu-jitsu would be even more dangerous, mm-hmm. as we've seen over the weekend. He's got to be able to implement uh, it. Exactly. Like, I, like he needs to learn to take that. Everyone thinks because you're, like, a lot of people are like, oh, he's a jiu-jitsu guy. But jiu-jitsu guys take down suck, man. I'm telling you. Like, they, they suck. They're garbage. I see it. Like, I've been around a lot of jiu-jitsu guys. Uh, tournament. Uh, a lot of them, they don't know what a takedown is. And me, I've, I've always worked on my wrestling, my throws. Uh, but, like, I'm not just your normal jiu-jitsu guy. That's what... And a lot of people uh, sometimes speculate that, but that's cool. They're, they're going to find out when I, I pick them up, slam them on their head, or, you know, I knock them out, uh, which I've done already. Uh, but, yeah, so, but I feel like Damian Maia is real good uh, as far as jiu-jitsu goes. I, I can't not think of anyone else right now. Uh, I don't know. For women's MMA, I would probably say, I, uh, Mackenzie Dern, her jiu-jitsu is real good. She wasn't able to do it over the weekend. Uh, but I feel like with jiu-jitsu, you know, a lot of people I see, like in MMA, are real lazy about it, man. Like, uh, the people that are, they'll, they'll just learn jiu-jitsu, but they're not, they're too worried about defending it instead of learning it. And I feel like, you know, it's crazy to me. If you're in the UFC and you don't, you're lacking these other areas of the game. It's like, man, like, I feel like, you know, this is your job. You should be, like, taking this seriously, learn everything, not just, oh, I just want to strike and defend a takedown, or I just want to do jiu-jitsu and not learn striking or wrestling. I feel you should learn it all. And uh, I think a lot of people that try to learn jiu-jitsu, I think they're learning it the wrong way. They're learning it uh, on a sport basis, like sport jiu-jitsu, more competition jiu-jitsu. Like, they'll go to these guys, like, uh, I don't know, like, uh, like great jiu-jitsu competitors, like world champions in, like, sport in the gi, like, I don't know, like, we'll say, like, Alto, so, like, you know, the Mendez brothers, like, Cabrina, those kind of guys, but it's like, you're learning jiu-jitsu, which is great, which I think you should do, do it that way, but at the same time, you need to be able to learn jiu-jitsu to implement it in MMA, how are you going to be able to do it in MMA, because a lot of that sports stuff doesn't carry over to MMA, you get pounded in the face, so I feel like a lot of guys, they're, they're partially doing it right, but at the same time, they need to having uh, somebody teaching them jiu-jitsu how to be able to do it in MMA because mm. jiu-jitsu and MMA and competition two different things and uh, it was a transition I had to go through when I went over to MMA like my jiu-jitsu games changed dramatically from uh, when I was in my sport jiu-jitsu days compared to now and uh, yeah I think that's the transition a lot of these guys you know, make that they want to get good at jiu-jitsu for MMA I, I, maybe you talk about that sort of lackadaisical jujitsu style. Perhaps that's why Damian Maya springs to mind so much because he was able to develop that systematic and you know purposeful uh, like application of his jujitsu in an MMA fight. Yeah, I agree. I think that's like he comes to mind. Like I feel like he's the first guy I've seen to really apply jujitsu correctly in MMA. From what I've seen, like he's able, he's utilizing everything. Uh, you know, the punches on, on the ground, opening the guys up, not thinking just hold on or, like, that kind of stuff. A lot of the sweeps he does, when he does his sweep, he, his head's hidden. He can't be hit. Uh, like, he gets under the guy. He's under the guy's chest and arm, and he elevates, gets under, hits a sweep or his takedown. Like, he's very well protected on the ground when he's doing his jiu-jitsu versus other guys. Like, they may be in their guard. They're trying to do inverted stuff, which, hey, Things will work. Anything's possible. Anything could work in MMA. But the percentage of it is uh, going to be very high of you getting punched in the face. So I feel like as long as you need to be aware of that kind of stuff, so having punches get thrown at you on the ground. Yeah, and uh, Johnny, I got a lot of respect for what you just said there. I love to hear the fact that, you know, it's it's MMA, it's not jiu-jitsu. You know, you got to be good everywhere. You got to be able to mix it up, you know, when you're grappling – 
you know, if you're training jiu-jitsu, yeah. you're not used to a knee coming and hitting you in the gut. So, you know, I love hearing yeah. that from you. And, and yeah, that's the, the right attitude to have towards your training. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I just, uh, I feel like you got you got to really dissect this game, man. There's so many, uh, you're never safe in MMA. So you should learn everything. Like, there's so many guys. Like, even, like, I'll see it from both sides uh, of the table. Like, I'll see a jiu-jitsu guy. They're only working in jiu-jitsu. Or strikers, like I'll see like with a lot of strikers or people that are striking base. Oh, why he, you know he's just laying on him. He's just laying on him. Uh, whatever. But it's like, dude, shut the fuck up, man. Like you, this is MMA. Like learn the whole game. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, I think yeah, people that are like that where they're only learning one thing or oh, he's hugging on me. They're not. They're very. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like. Uh, Close minded. Not weak minded, but uh, ignorant. Yeah, very close minded people. Ignorant. Uh, they have very little knowledge of the game. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, like I, I read books are like you know, you know, the Art of War. Anyone that's read the Art of War, like in that book, it's like learn all styles of fighting. You should be fighting to uh, to w- uh, win and to not get a uh, you know ambush that kind of stuff. So it's like you know. But those are the same uh, skill sets you applied like in freaking war, you know what I mean? And, you know, fighting is obviously not war, but it is the form of it. It is fighting. You should learn it all. Learn all areas. Learn all disciplines. Be, be well aware. Be schooled, trained, knowledge in every aspect of the game. And I feel like, I don't know, you just, you'll grow as a fighter. But when you say all this, oh, he's just hugging on me. Or, oh, he didn't want to go to the ground with me. It's like, dude, like you're in the wrong sport. If you want to just stay on the ground they do in jiu-jitsu tournaments if you want to see a striking contest maybe go do kickboxing you know what i mean well it's funny you make the war analogy because just like in uh, mma like the history of mma in war for all of time if the enemy was using something that was you know extra effective the other team was always like hey that's cheating yeah exactly so it's like if you're winning you know do it it ain't cheating learn it all so that's my mentality on it yeah so, Johnny, if, obviously you being an MMA fighter, you know, you're always working your boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, jiu-jitsu. If you were to take one martial art and recommend people to train it, what would it be and why? Here, it would be jiu-jitsu. And I'm not just saying that because, uh, you know, I come from that background. But I feel like with jiu-jitsu, it's a different kind of martial art. And uh, I think it's already been proven. Uh, when the Gracie family came over, the, the first UFC, it dominated. That's one reason I would say to do it. But at the same time, there's a certain bond you create with it. Uh, you know, in a box, like say a boxing gym, it's not the same bond in there. Uh, you know, they're, they're only looking for people that are, they're going to, gonna, you know, pay them their next paycheck. You know what I mean? Oh, this guy's going to be the next big star. It's my way out, whatever. Uh, but with jiu-jitsu, there's so many different kind of people that come in. Like you, you meet a lot of great people, a lot of shitty people, a lot of weird people. It's like, a, so you really get to know people. And I feel that's a big thing missing in the world. A lot of people don't know each other, what, what each other are about. So you really get to know people. Uh, you're in there training with them. Uh, you know, you're, you're grappling. It is a form of fighting. You're getting, uh, you know, choked out, that kind of stuff. Someone's laying on you. Uh, it's a, so it's a different thing. It's very humbling. If you've never done that stuff, maybe if you're, uh, you know, a great striker or a street fighter or whatever, you, you're going to come in jiu you're going to get your ass kicked. So it's very humbling. It's either going to make you or break you. And I think, uh, and everything I think is big for kids. I say women and kids is very important. Because I've seen so many kids come in, you know, that they were getting bullied at school, which, uh, you know, I, I hate that, that stuff. Kids get bullied. Uh, but, you know, they come in and develop this confidence. Like, these kids come in, you're like, man, this kid has no hope. Like, just, just a, you know, a weak kid, no confidence. And all of a sudden, you see that, that switch flip. Like, they're just really learning the technique. They, they're very talkative now, uh, confident. You know, they do better in school. They compete and end up becoming little beasts. Like, they, they went from a sheep to a lion. So, like, for me, seeing that stuff, it's like it's always great to see because, you know, I'm on my own journey, but anytime I can give back, uh, it, it really makes me uh, uh, happy. Any way I can give back, so I feel we should always give back. So that's why I recommend jujitsu. Uh, I think it, it, it really does change people's lives. 
for sure. Like jujitsu changes lives, and I, I really believe that. Uh, you know, like if you do boxing, you might get knocked out in the gym if you're a new guy. Uh, you're probably not going to come back. But with jujitsu, it's still very humbling. But it's one of those things. Just it's a journey, man. Uh, you know, through rank and everything. And of course, there's some shady instructors out there uh, that you know you got to watch out for. Uh, but you'll just know if you get the vibe. Everybody's cool there. Uh, you know, you fit in. You know, and just basically enjoy the ride, man. It, it does really change your life. For sure, man. That's awesome. And yeah, one thing from my experience, I've just noticed at the gym is, you know, like fighting, it's such a, you know, it's such a solo sport, but it really is, you know, in the gym environment, you know, you you form this bond through training, even just with random people. And, you know, next thing you know, you you kind of have this brotherhood and, you know, respect for each other, which is all of a sudden, you know, it's in that respect and, you make friends from it. So, so yeah, martial arts definitely yeah. has lots of benefit. And after you're done fighting, what's, what's your go-to food? Do you have a uh, after like, fight snack? Uh, you guys heard of in and out? Oh yeah. Yeah. In and out is bomb, man. That's a, uh, oh man, I don't even know those I eat, but I love that after fight. Do you get it animal uh, double, style? Double. Yeah, animal style, four by four, animal style fries, and then throw in that milkshake for extra measures. That's so bomb. That stuff right there. Let's um, go, champ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's either in and out or like tacos. I love tacos. Oh, uh, of so you're one of those two things. So yeah, that's after my fights, man. Man, I pick out. It's like so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Right on. Well, we'll give you. We'll let you go to class here because we know you got to be on time. Can't have you late for that master's degree. Um, if you have anyone or anything you want to shout out, any fight announcements, anything coming up you want to promote or uh, you know just send out there into the ether. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I appreciate you guys having me on the show. Uh, always. So it's a pleasure to be on here. Share a little bit about me on here. Uh, I appreciate you guys. So if you guys, anyone listening. Give me a follow. I'm on social media. You can find me at Kid Kavimbo. That's K I D K V E M B O. I'm on Instagram, Twitter. I have a fan page on Facebook as well. I have a, I just made a YouTube channel, so I'll be posting like new content, new videos up on there soon. Uh, so yeah, I'm always uh, you know looking to share my knowledge with everybody you know interested. So give me a follow. I'm gonna be in the UFC soon. And, uh, you know, I appreciate you guys for having me on the show. And, you know, give this account, uh, Throwing Bones MMA, a follow as well. So, thank you. Well, yeah. thanks for that. We really appreciate that, Johnny. Yeah, we yeah, appreciate thank you guys. it. I appreciate everything. Yeah, we appreciate you coming on the show. And we look forward to seeing you fighting in the UFC soon. Oh, yeah, man. I'm going to be there soon, real soon. So, you guys uh, keep a lookout for that. Yeah, for Absolutely. You. Hopefully, when your signing is announced, we can get you back on the show. Awesome. I'd love to do that again. For sure. Well, yeah, thanks Thanks once again for taking your time. Join us on the Throwing Bones MMA podcast. Have a great night. You too. You guys stay warm up in there, right? Yeah, of course. We'll do our best. Thanks. All right. Take All it right. easy. Bye. Bye.